word you hear in China is lao wai, and you hear it because if you're a foreigner like me, someone is talking about you. China's relationship with outsiders is complicated, and that's reflected in the language. For one and a half millennia, the Silk Road was China's overland connection to much of the wider world, and for numerous moments during those many centuries, China was a place of wealth and innovation and power. It's something the country is trying to reboot with their One Belt One Road initiative, with the belt referring to the overland routes and the road, somewhat confusingly, referring to the sea routes. Historically, though, those who come from the West. The Europeans, the Arabs, the Africans, are considered differently to other Asians, with whom the Chinese have often had more interconnectivity, whether this be cultural exchange, economic, or warfare. China has at times been welcoming of foreigners, embracing the influence of their ideas in religion and commerce, and at other times more hostile. Considering the recent history of Western foreigners in this part of the world. One might not expect the Chinese to be the most welcoming of people. The period between the First Opium War in 1839 and the so-called liberation of China by the communists in 1949 is known in China as the Century of Humiliation. European powers and the mighty Japan use their heft to plunder and murder, and generally inflict turmoil. The Chinese name for China, Zhongguo, literally means the Middle Kingdom. I.e., the civilization is thought to be at the center of everything. That China, with its vast territory and ingenuity, with its proud five thousand years of continuous history, with its terracotta army escort to the underworld, that this place could be treated so unfairly, so brutally, must have been unforgivable, a true stain on the national psyche. And indeed, the consequences of this humiliation are profound. They are found in the political setup of modern China. And it's fair to say, in the psychology of the Chinese people themselves, but that doesn't mean that the Chinese are unwelcoming to foreigners. Not at all. In modern assertive China, the foreigner is a welcome specimen, albeit still a very foreign specimen. The economic imperative to bring in people, something embarked upon cautiously by the Chinese government, is complemented by a populace that genuinely embraces the mysteries of the outsider, although. Stereotypes play a large part in the perceptions of people, for better or worse. Black British and Americans find it harder to get jobs teaching English, and often get their own terms when being referred to. In fact, even a British Chinese person will find it harder to get a job teaching English in China, because of the premium put on the ethnic authenticity of the teacher. Many of these schools are businesses, and they're trying to convince parents that their teachers can impart the language to their kids, for many reasons. The main qualification is that the person looks like what they imagine an English speaker to look like, and that's probably what Harry Potter looks like. For the last fifty years or so, China has been on a pretty steep upwards trajectory, and while parts of the West are mired in confusion and in fighting, probably a consequence of their relative decline, Chinese people seem to be looking firmly forward to the future, to new opportunities for themselves and their children. Never in human history have so many people been brought out of poverty than in communist China. And that's just a fact. Although whether communist China is really communist is a question that we'll have to come back to. Still, it bodes well for the governing party. There might be some signs that the optimism is beginning to crack, and we'll get to that later too. But 2049, a hundred years on from the communist takeover, is penciled in the little red diary as the date by which China will be the world's dominant power, and they've been there before. But for the time being, foreigners. And white foreigners, in particular, represent wealth, progress, and opportunity. Some Chinese companies pay them to simply wander around the office, oozing glamour. Others pay them to talk enthusiastically about property or products to a Chinese audience who don't even understand the words sometimes. But just as the overseas Chinese are always Chinese, regardless of what their passport says, the outsider is always an outsider. Perhaps the most famous English teacher in Chinese history was Reginald Johnston, a Scot who lived in Beijing's royal palace, the Forbidden City, tutoring a teenager called Pui. This teenager had a foreign tutor because he was China's emperor. Although since the revolution in 1911, the job had undergone a reevaluation. Pui's stumble from the dragon throne into obscurity occurred under the tussle of numerous national and international aggressors. First, he remained the nominal emperor under nationalist control, 
then a puppet emperor under Japanese control, then the Soviet's prisoner until the communists took control, when he became the communist prisoner. Somewhat amazingly, throughout the turmoil, he was always treated pretty well. And there's a reason for this. Each adversary knew how to use him for their own ends. Factions, power bases and cunning are fundamental to Chinese history, as we'll discover later. Alongside Reginald was Isabel Ingram, the American who tutored the Empress Wanrold. The Empress was decidedly unlucky when compared to her husband. She hated life in the Forbidden City, and that was before the Japanese would show up and make things so much worse. She became addicted to opium and gave birth to an illegitimate child, who was killed immediately. Later, when the communists were closing in, Puyi abandoned her and she was caught. A hopeless drug dependent, Wan Rong was thrown into prison and died aged 39. In China, as the tales of Johnston, Ingrams and later J.G. Ballard attest, foreigners usually somehow manage to observe the drama rather than end up on the sharp end of it. It's one of the results of being an outsider by definition, and no doubt this is something of a bonus when it comes to narrow self-interest. I figured I could work with that as I went to Changshu to be an English teacher. I'd keep my head down, do my job, and be the best damn Lao Wai I could be. No drama during my stint, thank you very much. Speaking of Lao Wai, on to the language. Well, back home in Great Britain and across the West, much sensitivity has come to surround certain words which relate to the quote-unquote other. Out of the storm of identity politics, inoffensive terms have been promoted to mitigate the harm caused by offensive terms or disempowering terms. What's acceptable is the result of the to and fro of discourse, and not everyone stays ahead of the changing lexicon. Jess, who you'll meet later, would tell me off for suggesting that she brainstorm ideas with her class. I should have said mind map, she told me. Brainstorm is offensive to those with mental health problems. But I have mental health problems, I said. That's not the point, she said. Well, that's the sociology lesson over. Now, why does this matter? Because the Chinese word lao wai translates as foreigner. Well, that's not quite true, actually. The most common or formal term for foreigner is wai guaran. Wai means outside, guo means nation or country, and ren means person or people, wai guaran. Outside country person, foreigner. In English, foreigner is another one of those sensitive words suggesting difference, hierarchy, or maybe even hostility. Is this also the case in China? Should we be getting offended when we hear these words? Well, in China, 92% of the people come from the Han ethnicity. The remaining 8%, a mere 100 million people or so, make up the 55 recognised ethnic minorities and a few unrecognised, and are largely confined to the western and northern provinces. A western foreigner, hence, stands out fairly sharply, and Wai Guaran and Lao Wai usually refer to westerners, not other Asians. It should also be noted that in China, appearances and differences are generally commented upon more hastily than you'd find in the UK. Whether you are handsome or fat, you'll be told about it in this matter-of-fact way. This too will come up later. And that goes for ethnicity too, although it's very rare that this comes across as unfriendly. Chinese will tell you that there isn't the same kind of sensitivity about ethnic differences, and so it's not particularly rude to use labels. Those that are more rude tend to refer to Japanese or Koreans, due to a mix of historical reasons and contemporary cultural and political rivalries. There's also plenty of judgment saved for others inside China too, marking out differences between northerners and southerners, city people and country people, the Han and the other ethnic groups. Still, that doesn't stop Westerners questioning whether the language is appropriate, especially Lao Wai. Internet articles and forums have Westerners discussing the supposed or potential prejudice contained in this word, and while some chalk it up as a neutral term used simply as a descriptor for Western foreigners, others definitely hear an insult, although they tend to arrive at this conclusion by imposing their own standards of how to address someone i.e. you wouldn't go around New York referring to non-white people as foreigners, would you? But China isn't New York. It isn't the melting pot. It's the Middle Kingdom. The culture is different, yes, but also the way the language works is different. Still, the considered Chinese interlocutor does not usually say Lao Wai. It's not said in formal greetings, and it has been discouraged by the Chinese government on occasion. Instead, it comes from the kids and the elderly at the roadside. 
This might sound like a very modern preoccupation, but that's not so. In the Treaty of Tianjin, at the close of the Second Opium War, the British demanded that the Qing government stop referring to them as Yi, or barbarians. And other terms which have courted controversy over the years in China include the Chinese terms for foreigners like Yang Guizhi, or foreign devils, and Da Bizhi, big nose. These are typically seen as more clearly discriminatory, but I don't recall them ever being thrown my way, while Lao Wai is used far more commonly. I'm no linguist and not even particularly good with Mandarin, so I cannot explain with any great accuracy the depth of nuance in the word Lao Wai. But the first part, Lao, usually means old or maybe an old relationship. Lao can also mean wise and respectable, and it can also mean old fashioned or boring. Then again, it can also be a meaningless prefix. So who knows? The Y in Lao Wai means outside, same as in Wai Guoren. So no big mystery to that part. China has had this insider outsider relationship with foreigners for countless years. And so the idea that the term Lao Wai denotes an old, respectful relationship has some appeal. And that generous spirit towards other peoples could also be reflected in the Chinese names for foreign countries. For example, England is Inguo, which literally means brave country. America is Mei Guo, which literally means beautiful country. So far, so good. But dig a little deeper and you discover that Spain, or Xibanya, means Western class teeth. Italy or Italy means hoping for big profits and Wei Di Mala, the Chinese name for Guatemala, means in the land of danger, the horse pulls. So much for the fancies of interpretation. Instead, one learns that this leap from certainty, from the way things appear, into ambiguity, is the journey that all travellers embark upon when going to China. The literalism of the language masks a world of hidden meaning and subtle gestures. China, at times, is a hall of mirrors. Unable to really understand the word Lao Wai from the perspectives of the foreigners themselves or the meaning of the characters, I turn to some Chinese friends. Surely they'd know, and I've included a couple of quotes here. So Spring told me it can have two meanings, one for surprised Chinese who think that foreigners are special, to say you have a Lao Wai friend is to show off a bit. But there's a negative way, and this often comes from older generations who have never seen foreigners before, and they might be a little bit defensive, as if the foreigner is still threatening. Seven said Lao Wai is the most popular way for Chinese to refer to foreigners, but for me, Wai Guoren is my own style to say, because I believe it is more polite to say this, and a better way to make friends with them. Coco said... It's hard to say if the words have different meanings. It's more about feelings. Lao means old and Wai means outsiders. And because Chinese feel that foreigners generally look older than us, so we add old before outsiders. At first, Lao Wai is an offensive word, but now it can be friendly. Well, not very offensive, just not friendly. So if they call you Lao Wai, it doesn't mean they don't like you. Well, that's reassuring. And Sarah said Lao Wai contains some disrespect. Lao is also used to call someone who is very familiar to the speaker. If someone happens to see a foreigner on the street, maybe in this situation Lao Wai shows some curiosity and excitement, although with a slight bit of rudeness, although the speaker may not mean it. Lao doesn't mean old, it's just a way to call someone. So yeah, it's a little different person to person. But my takeaway is this. Lao Wai, it means foreigner, but it's not offensive, it's just informal. But it's not uncommon that Westerners in China get a little bit uppity about these kinds of issues and their sense of being an outsider in a country in which they either work short term or live long term. And I think that's where uh, one aspect of the culture shock comes from. And culture shock in China is not an uncommon thing. Next time on Stuck in the Middle Kingdom with you, I'll get on with the story and I'll introduce this school that I ended up living in. I'll see you there.